Welcome to another session of the Council of the Americas Democracy Dialogues, a conversation we need to be having now about the state of democracy in the Americas. I'm your series host, Eric Farnsworth. The Summit of the Americas is a periodic gathering of democratically elected leaders from across the Americas, this time in Los Angeles, that allows us to take stock of where we've come from and where we may be going in democracy in the Americas. My guest today is His Excellency Ivan Duque, the President of the Republic of Colombia, who will shortly be concluding his term in office. We are coming to you from the Embassy of Colombia in Washington, where the President is celebrating, along with his First Lady and Vice President and others, 200 years of friendship between the United States and Colombia. Mr. President, welcome to Democracy Dialogues. Eric, thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to be here with you. Colombia has just gone through the first round of elections. You have the second round shortly. What does the world need to know about Colombia's democracy? We have one of the oldest democracies in the Western Hemisphere, a robust and strong democracy where every four years we have a transition, a peaceful transition. People go to the polls and they vote in favor of policies that will benefit them or they also reject policies that they believe are not sound for the country. So I, I believe we, we had a very interesting uh, first round debate and now we're going to this um, last round of elections where we hope to have a massive participation of the Colombian people and that we can elect the next president of our country. The process of the election has been complemented by outside observers. What's your secret about the process of running elections in Colombia with quick counts and readily accepted results? Well, it has been a process that has been maturing over time. Long time ago, even my father was the director of the electoral system as national registrator for Colombia. And I believe we have a good use of technology. We have a good uh, use of telecommunications. And we have a process that has many steps that allows the electoral authority to trace from the ballot to the counting of the votes so that there's no dispute in the middle. And I think those has, have been things that have matured over time. And I think today with the usage of technology, we, can, we have accelerated a lot the way we count the votes. So people go to the polls and we'll know who the winner is in less than two hours. And that gives credibility and, and ready acceptance of the people of Colombia to the results. I think it's a very important aspect. Indeed, indeed, I think that, that has created trust. And I think Colombian people have felt over time that the electoral organization gives the results and they are respected. And something that is important to say is that international observers, because we have maybe the, the, the biggest amount of observers ever in a Colombian election, I think they have also, from their side, experienced a trustful system. So I think this, this makes also our democracy strong with an independent electoral authority. Let's take a broader lens if we can. Let's look at the region as a whole. Uh, democracy in some ways is under challenge. How do you see the democratic health of the Western Hemisphere today? Eric, I believe that democracy is like health. When you have it, you take it for granted. When you're losing it, you try to claim it back uh, with all your force. But that doesn't regularly happen. So I think democracies are now threatened by, by different phenomena. I think the fake news phenomenon is something that affects democracy because it seems that for some, the idea that perception is reality has become the weapon that they use in order to destroy facts and try to, out of a lie, create a, um, you know, exponential growth in terms of um, trends and the way they mobilize those, those sentiments in the, in the media or in the social media and how they, they harm the perception of the population. The other thing is populism, which is always a threat to democracy. And I also might say that polarization mm -hmm. is the way that many use in, in today electoral systems in order to put themselves in an extreme, then try to bridge the divide in order to win. But what happens is that a lot of people have won elections in Latin America through democracy, but once they get to power, they move democracy to a dictocracy and then they change dictocracy to a dictatorship. And we have to prevent those models to, to continue 
happening in Latin America. And yet we've seen that trend, haven't we, almost accelerate in, in Latin America across the region. Uh, and many folks are concerned about that. Are there some strategies? Are there some things that leaders can do from the public sector, the private sector, NGOs, to try to recapture some of yes, the, the health yes. of the Well, of I, I think that there democracy. is a great documentary that, that was um, that launched a couple of years ago in the United States called The Social Media Dilemma, mm -hmm. that it shows how social media can be manipulated and why the negative use of social media can destroy democracy. Because when facts don't matter, when numbers don't matter, when results don't matter, and what matters is how do you destroy the perception of the citizen vis-a-vis uh, -vis an individual or a policy, well, those, those are things that, that we definitely need, need to fix. Uh, when we look at the way the, the, the electoral system has been polarized from the United States to La Patagonia is because it seems that today it's better to be furious than, than to be calm, than to be moderate. And I, I hope that this is just stage that we're living and that people will get more conscious about how to better exercise the, the freedom to choose. But I. I strongly believe those are major threats we have in the democratic system. But also, when you look at figures that in Latin America have been uh, uh, in instrumental and were instrumentalized by extreme, extreme left or extreme uh, uh, abuse, as the case of Maduro, well, we have to prevent those, those regimes to keep on influencing our democratic systems in order to generate more conflict. But I am always an optimistic, Eric, and so I believe we're going to pass with this storm and many countries are going to suffer, unfortunately, and once they suffer, they realize they did it, they, they took the wrong decision. I hope that's not going to be the Colombian case. And definitely, we all want uh, our democracies to excel, and we, it can only excel by trying to put um, maybe moderate and, and not biased sentiments and be able to create more of a policy stand that benefits the majority of the people. The Summit of the Americas was created specifically for democratically elected leaders. From and the it should remain minister. like that. How it should remain like that. I mean, people are trying, some people are trying to say, okay, why don't you bring Nicaragua? Why don't you bring Cuba? Why don't you bring Maduro? Well, they, they can't get in. I mean, they, they can't access the club because it is a, a, a mechanism for democratic countries to debate about future policies. And that's why in September 11, 2001, in Peru, the Inter-American Democratic Charter was, was approved unanimously. And it is because we don't want dictatorships to, to uh, expand in Latin America, and we don't want uh, dictocracies to expand in Latin America. So whomever is leading a regime that is limiting freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of, of uh, e e economic uh, policies, well, they have to be rejected, and that's why I strongly support the idea that no dictatorial regime in Latin America is allowed to go to the summit. When I say the word China, what comes to mind? A partner, a trade partner, a friend, and uh, obviously uh, a country that is growing at a very fast pace and that has turned itself into one of the biggest economies in the world. Uh, but as I say, we are the U.S. number one strategic ally in the Western Hemisphere, but we also have a diplomatic tie with, with China, and we want to close the trade deficit, and that means we have to look for opportunities for our products to access the Chinese market, but I think we are respectful on, on, on the political systems, but I think our values, our core values, our principles have been fully aligned for many, many years with the United States, not because we see this as, some, uh, as, a, as a negotiation of interest, but because we really share a common vision. And I also have to thank China's interest in Colombia, the investment that we have in Colombia, how they uh, allowed us to buy vaccines at an early stage and how they supported Colombia when there was a shortage of vaccines around the world. So we appreciate that. And if you ask me, I'd rather not to have this kind of geopolitical debates involved in international relations because in my opinion, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help. 
doesn't help uh, nor two of the, the two countries, but it doesn't help the way countries behave towards one another because it's not that China, uh, China shall now be considered an enemy or, or an opposer. There are differences, but I think China today is relevant in economic terms, not only to all the Latin American countries, but also to the United States. You're here in Washington to celebrate, speaking of, uh, 200 years of friendship between the United States and Colombia, 200 years of diplomatic uh, relations and friendship and partnership. Uh, what do you think the next 200 years of friendship will hold? Well, I think we, we, have, we have gotten to maybe the, the highest uh, peak ever in bilateral relationships with the Declaration of Colombia of being a non-NATO NATO ally, non-NATO member, a strategic ally of the United States. And that is the, the biggest diplomatic recognition Colombia has gotten. That was only privileged to few countries. Now Colombia enters there, but Colombia is one of the main recipients of international aid from the United States. And it's because we have built a relationship of trust, not only in the way we develop certain policies, but also on law and order. We have been able to reach during my administration the lowest homicides rates in a, in a four-year term in comparison with my seven predecessors that we have been able to, to have the major reductions on kidnapping to reach the lowest rates of kidnapping since we started counting those, those crimes. But also, we, we have seen how, in terms of law and order, we have reached record highs in interdiction, and we have reached also record highs in the destruction of cocaine-producing labs. So all that demonstrates that when we work together with common purposes, and if it's law and order, we have uh, results to show, and if it's climate change, we have results to show. And if it's energy transition, we have results to show. And I think that's something that enriches the bilateral relationship between Colombia and the United States. Mr. President, last question. The United States and Colombia have been partners in democracy promotion, not just in the Western Hemisphere, but frankly around the world, uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, other places like that. What do you think are some of the lessons uh, that we might be able to take away from some of that in terms of how we work together and some of the successes in terms of democracy? The success promotion? is Colombia has built a relationship with the United States that is bipartisan. And when it comes to the Hill, that has been bicameral. So Colombia has received strong support for Republican governments and has also received strong support from Democratic governments. And I think as of today, we're one of the largest recipients of USA resources in the region, but it's because we have set uh, policies that are beneficial for the poorest of the poor and in order to protect those that have been harmed by the phenomenons of dictatorship in Venezuela. We have been able to see in Colombia how when we work with communities, we can massify uh, rural land titles and at the same time that we can give communities the possibility to have natural conservation contracts to earn a legal income instead of being tempted by, by getting into criminal activity. So all that, which is I think is a major success that we have built together, demonstrates that having the right bilateral relationship based on values and principles is a trigger of the mobilization of resources, but I should say it is more important to, to express that the policy we have been able to, to build over the years made Colombia pass from a, a democracy that was at the brink of being a failed state 20 years ago to be now Colombia the 37th member of the OECD. Mr. President, the record of achievement of the Colombian people has been nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, and you and your government, but the Colombian people are also to be fully congratulated for the progress that you all have made. And uh, we look forward to continued progress in the future and continued partnership between the United States and Colombia. Thank you for joining us. At the thank you so much, Eric. And, and thank you for allowing me to be once again in this uh, session uh, with you and also for all the followers of the council. And I have to express the deepest gratitude because you and the council have been promoters of democracy, but you have also been promoters of the values that we have shared over the years. It has been our privilege. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Eric. Indeed. All the best. Okay. Gracias.